Okay. All my friends are here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Uh, with me at my virtual fireside uh, is the Honorable David Norquist, the Under Secretary of Defense Comptroller, but currently performing the duties of the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way we're going to run today is Secretary Norquist is going to make some opening remarks. Then he and I are going to have a bit of a chat. We'll reserve some time at the end for questions from the audience. Uh, and once we conclude, the Secretary's on a very tight schedule, so if I could ask everyone to keep their seats uh, while he exits, then we can wrap up. You can have another cookie, cup of coffee, etc. <laughs> on the way out. Uh, I also do want to mention at the top that uh, the, our new budget report on the 2020 President's Budget Request is out today. Um, there are copies uh, out at the check-in desk. If you didn't get one on the way in, please feel free to pick one up on the way out. Uh, and uh, with that, Secretary Norquist, the floor is yours. Okay. Can everyone hear me well? Excellent. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Susanna, for hosting. The National Defense Strategy of the 2020 Budget, very important subject, particularly because when we look ahead, future conventional wars are going to look very different from the conventional wars that we have seen since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the counterterrorism, the, more, the longer counterterrorism operations we've encountered. In those opponents we faced, traditionally didn't have much of a navy, uh, not a particularly powerful air force. They lacked ability to go after space or cyber. So they were mainly limited to operating in one domain and land. And in a conventional conflict, those are very quick and lopsided affairs. And so Desert Shield, Desert Storm, like that, tended to last less than 45 days. So for Americans who follow the news, they generally have exposure to sort of long counterterrorism operations and very short conventional wars. And if, you need to, if you're trying to go back, you end up going to Korea or World War II to find a conventional conflict of a long duration. But the challenge is the world has changed dramatically since Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Our allies looked at what we did. They looked, I mean, our, our opponents looked at what we did, the approach we took, and started designing militaries to counter them. So if you look at China and Russia, they come with sophisticated air forces and navies, but particularly they've developed anti-satellite capability, cyber capability, missiles of long, uh, short, medium, and long range to create what is often called an anti-access area denial environment. They're investing in new technologies, artificial intelligence, hypersonic, things that will greatly complicate uh, our situation as well as change the way the war is, is fought. So the national defense strategy recognized this. It recognized that we need to focus on being able to prevail in the high-end fight, that we needed to be able to function across multiple domains against a near-peer competitor. And the defense budget for fiscal year 2020, like the ones that preceded it, builds on that one and drives the department in that direction. So the budget We'll often use $750 billion. That's the entire national security budget. The DOD portion of that request is $718 billion. And it executes the national defense strategy by basically doing four things. First of all, it significantly increases the investment in space and cyberspace, particularly 15% in space and an additional 10% in cyber, as well as you'll see we have either have established or establishing organizational changes to reflect those both becoming warfighting domains. You'll also see additional investments in air, land, and sea to modernize the force. This is the largest shipbuilding request in 20 years, and it reflects the nature of the Pacific and the challenges we'd face there. Third and equally important is the emphasis on innovation, artificial intelligence, hypersonics, unmanned aerial vehicles, surface, and so forth, that we are developing and experimenting with and prototyping in order to build out and prepare for the future conflicts, the R&D, program has a significant increase and I think represents the largest RDT in request in 70 years. And that really shows the direction and the emphasis that we take as we transition. We also sustain and build on the readiness improvements that we've achieved over the previous ones. There's a 3.1% pay raise for the military. That's the largest in 10 years, but it reflects the need to sustain the high quality force that we've been building up and establishing. The other thing about this is we do all of those improvements and those changes, and yet defense remains near historic lows as a percentage of GDP and a percentage of the federal budget. So we're functioning about 3.1% of GDP right now. That stays about the 3.3% uh, range as you go out into the future. The economic growth is a tremendous help. It's a great friend for anyone interested in national security, a strong economy. The, um, the additional thing is as the share of the federal budget, we're down to about 
significantly lower where we've been. In fact, you go back enough years, and I think Fed, uh, defense spending were 50 percent. So when you get to that point, you're providing the foundation that makes everything else possible, but you're really not the driver in a lot of the, the deficit and other discussions. You're a uh, uh, smaller player in the piece. But we did this because we understand that when you look to the future, the stakes are clear. If we want peace, our adversaries need to know that there's no path to victory through fighting us. The military superior is not a given. It's not a birthright. We have to pay attention to it each and every generation and to protect it and build the type of force that will deter conflict. And that's what the NDS does, and that's what the 2020 budget does, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Uh, well, I'll, thank you very much for that you know, very um, cogent kind of lay down of how the threat environment has changed and how the strategy and budget has responded to those changes in the threat environment. I think I want to stick with the national defense strategy mm -hmm. for a moment. Uh, it's been almost 18 months <laughs> since uh, then Secretary Mattis rolled out mm -hmm. the national defense strategy, and it seems like a good time to kind of check in mm -hmm. uh, and see how we're doing. So, you know, how do you think the department is doing in implementing the NDS? Um, you know, what grade would you give it, and, uh, you know, what's still on the to-do list? Sure. So I come from New England, so we use sports analogies instead of school analogies. Okay. And you sort of say, did we do what we needed to do in the regular season for the postseason? I think if you look at the national defense strategy, the first question that came out of the sequestration period was readiness, right? It's hard to have a focus on the future challenges if you're not getting the training and the experience that the force needs today. And so I think we've seen significant improvements in readiness. The Army's gone from 18 to 28 brigade combat teams that meet their readiness standards. The Air Force has seen a 24 percent increase in the number of operational squadrons ready for the high-end fight. We're not done. You know, readiness is not something you do once and walk away from. But we've really seen a dramatic step forward in that direction. And, you know, in this budget and others, our focus there is, is sustaining it. But the second thing you need to be able to do in implementing this is you have to have a consensus around the, the strategy. It's not the department strategy. It's the American people's strategy. But I think when you look across the Hill and think tanks and others, there's a great deal of support for the national defense strategy. There's a recognition that the focus on the high-end fight is the right one. There's uh, an agreement on the importance of innovation and technology and the changes that are being discussed. There's always some difference of which projects or which programs or how fast, and those are all perfectly reasonable discussions within that boundary. But I think that really laid down the foundation along with increases in, in munitions and lethality that are key to being able to get us on the right foot. Yeah. So kind of speaking of this emergent consensus mm -hmm. around the strategic direction established mm -hmm. in the National Defense Strategy, I would agree with you. It's um, pretty strong and bipartisan within the defense establishment. Mm -hmm. But once you get outside the beltway or even across the river sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some gaps and steams start to appear. You know, when you look at polling data, for example, on what uh, the average American thinks is a primary threat, they always mm -hmm. go to terrorism. China mm -hmm. frequently doesn't even make the list. Mm -hmm. And so how do, we, how do we broaden that consensus, you know, beyond this kind of narrow group of experts we have here? So first of all, I, th I think it's part of our responsibility to be looking out to the challenges that aren't making the morning news, mm -hmm. right? I mean, every one of us who's read a history book has come across examples of paying attention to the last conflict or the current news, not driving strategy in the right direction. But I think it's important to, you know, to educate the American people on what those trade-offs and what those challenges look like and the importance of defense. I actually don't mind the fact that people feel comfortable in times that the Defense Department's in good hands and they're focused on other priorities in their life. That's sometimes a, a key sign of success. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important for everyone to understand why we're investing in the future and the technologies and being aware, particularly of space and cyberspace and how those domains change warfare. Yeah. Um, so sticking with this thread for a minute, you know, we've seen in the past couple of weeks some heightened mm -hmm. tensions with Iran and sort of um, a lot of different actions that have both kind of turned up the heat and then tried to turn it back down again. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's raised some questions in my mind, at least, about whether the national defense strategy continue to survive contact with reality in that way. If we, you know, we're seeing for more forces mm -hmm. flow into the Middle East, um, that comes at a cost in terms mm -hmm. of readiness and opportunity costs for things they could be doing elsewhere. I wonder how you think about uh, that balance in terms of retaining the department's focus on, on the higher end sure. threats. So I see that as, a, as an example of the success of the national defense strategy, and particularly dynamic force employment. We built the strategy with an understanding there would always be challenges other than China and Russia. You know, Iran and others particularly fall into that area. And the ability for the department to 
realign forces in the middle of a year to a theater to be able to either do force protection or deterrence is an essential part of that. And our ability to, to do that without distracting or pulling us away from the long-range pattern. So we're still doing the research. We're still doing the technology. We're still doing the program. All those things continue on that path of the national defense strategy, even as we respond to current events. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have any concerns uh, about the department losing focus? No, I think that, you know, as I, I joked with people, I said if, you know, uh, if I were to, to drop dead tomorrow and the next person took my place and you asked them, what are you focused on, they would say the national defense strategy. You know, it's like the, the Civil War units. The next one up, we'd say the national defense strategy, and we'd keep moving. Excellent. Um, so transitioning to the budget request... Mm -hmm. Uh, for 2020, when Secretary Mattis rolled out the national defense strategy, he, in response to a question that occurred that day, was pretty clear that that the strategy gave programmatic direction to emphasize the capability of the force, meaning what the Joint Force is able to do in terms of advanced technology, mm -hmm. et cetera, over capacity, meaning mm -hmm. the absolute size of the mm -hmm. force. Um, and... and uh, you know, that was sort of music to ears mm -hmm. of those of us who were around in the late Obama administration mm -hmm. Department of Defense as we were pushing hard in the same direction. And yet, uh, so much of what we hear coming out of the services in particular, the Navy, 355 mm -hmm. ships, the Air Force now, kind of following in, that foot, in their footsteps with 386 squadrons, seems to be focused on numbers instead of, instead of the qualitative measures mm -hmm. of, of what the force is able to do. And I was wondering if you could help me reconcile that. You know, at the end of the day, what is more important? So that we always start, the, the more important place is the capability. It's the being able to function across each of the different domains and meet, reaching the emerging threats in the places where they are. One of the, the challenges with, uh, f with uh, the size of the force as an issue in terms of uh, driving things is you need to make sure you can sustain it. Right. What we have worked hard with our recovery is to avoid having a hollow force. And you don't want to build up a force structure that you can't sustain the maintenance, the spare parts, the training, those other operations. And so, one, the services always have responsibility to lay out, hey, to do the full thing, here's the, the target number. And they do those, and we use those in our analysis. But we've been very cautious. Most of the additional personnel we talk about are going to filling out units or expanding on a particular capability with the, until you have real certainty in the long-term budget, you can easily increase the size of the force only to have to walk it back three years later, mm -hmm. and that's a whole bunch of money that didn't go into new technologies, and yet you don't have anything to show for those investments. Okay. But 355 is still the goal, 355 ships in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're all, I think, waiting eagerly for the new force structure assessment mm -hmm. forthcoming later this year. Um, to, to kind of stick with that point for a second, when we look at the collisions that occurred in, in mm -hmm. the Pacific in 2017, um, is that what you're describing when you're talking about filling out units, getting those ships better manned and better maintained? You know, the debate rages on mm -hmm. as to what the actual underlying causes were, whether it all rests on the shoulder of the captain of the ship or whether there were bigger structural issues. So I always, I always want to be careful linking a particular event, a helicopter that crashes or a ship thing, with the long runs trends. But I think we all understand that if you don't do maintenance, those helicopters aren't flying, mm -hmm. right? And so we had a, a situation with a number of our aircraft and other things not able to perform their mission because of readiness issues that were moving past. We also understand units that don't have the full strength have challenges performing their mission. And mm -hmm. so we look to make sure... You know, one of the things is we bring in about 270,000 people into the military every year. Each one of those folks needs to be trained on how to perform their function, how to fly that piece of equipment, how to shoot that weapon, how to do those things. And so if you have a year of sequestration or something else where you've had massive cancellations of training, that has serious effects for all of those incoming folks. And so you need to make sure you keep that up in order to keep the readiness level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another way to kind of read some programmatic guidance into the national defense strategy, at least the unclassified summary that, mm -hmm. that we've all had access to, um, is to kind of interpret a willingness to accept a little bit of increased risk in the present mm -hmm. in order to drive down risk in the future. It's always a balancing act mm -hmm. of, of where you're going to park your risk in the program. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, how you think the department is doing in this regard. Maybe we could talk through a couple of specific examples. You know, the Navy made a substantial investment this year in both unmanned surface and mm -hmm. subsurface vessels, for example. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about, about how we're doing on balancing that 
risk calculation. So I think they did the right balance. I think the types of technologies you're talking about is the place we clearly put the emphasis. You'll, you'll see it across a number of R&D programs and, and prototyping. And it was a, a conscious decision to expand our efforts there rather than to significantly expand the size of the force structure. Mm -hmm. And that's a recognition that our risk is greater in the technology area and ending up not competitive with the future threats than it is in the near term on the force structure. And so again, it's a risk. You always have risk in terms of how much you may be asked to do now. Mm -hmm. But that's the place where the department decided to put its emphasis. Okay. Um, but, but on the other hand, there are a couple programs, um, for example, the Air Force's LCAT, low cost, mm -hmm. low cost attritable uh, aircraft, and mm -hmm. the uh, program that basically is working on the artificial intelligence that's going to help with C2 for some mm -hmm. of those un uninhabited platforms. That seems like frustratingly slow. Um, is the technology just not there yet? Is it not enough of a priority? Are there too many other competing priorities in the department? to move after some of those things more aggressively? So the challenge with any type of R&D and prototyping is that certain things advance quickly, other ones run into technical issues. The leadership has to spread their, their investments across each and see how they perform. So I am confident over time these will, these will pan out and they'll move forward, but I'd be in a hard place to tell you which one's going to move forward first and the fastest. And part of it is you put them in the hands of experimenters and warfighters and you discover the thing you thought was incomplete has tremendous value now. And then you're like, okay, you know, this is sort of the fate of the predator, which didn't pass OT&E, and the warfighter said, don't care, right? <laughs> get, get it to me now. I can use it even if it doesn't do everything yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're going to continue to work with these technologies and see how we can get them out there. Are there other examples of, of um, kind of bets the department is making that you think are promising or? Well, I think we're looking at a range. I mean, there's a you always have the ones with the, the unmanned aerial vehicles on the subsurface. You have the issues with high energy lasers. For me, the interesting thing is going to be the combination of these with things like artificial intelligence. And so here's where I'd make a distinction, which is there are certain things we're buying and researching, like hypersonic missiles that pay for, perform a specific function, mm -hmm. right? And you can see in advance this is going to do the following. There are others that will interact with other platforms and assets in a way you can't quite envision its full utility. And so artificial intelligence falls heavily into that area where mm -hmm. you link it with UAVs or you link it with other programs and you start to say, what am I capable of doing differently than I planned? And that's where you really have a, a change in what warfighting looks like and that's where the experimentation becomes key. Yeah, um, I agree completely. So let's hang on that point for a mm -hmm. minute because I think it's fascinating. You know. Um, hypersonic weapons, for example, the military is the only customer mm -hmm. for that technology, right? So it follows that it's going to be the department. Their hands the in the back did buy some. <laughs> and the defense industrial base mm -hmm. who are going to develop those things. Artificial intelligence, on the other hand, is extremely broad Correct. application. You know, Paul Shari and others here who do a lot of work on that topic have likened it to electricity mm -hmm. or the internal combustion engine, right? Like a, right. a technology that has the ability to apply across a very broad spectrum of economic activity, military activity, et cetera. So I wonder how you think about the way that the de department invests its research dollars in things uh, that we cannot count on the private sector to come up mm -hmm. with on their own, like hypersonics, versus how you think about uh, approaches to innovating something like artificial intelligence, right. which does have very broad application in the private sector. So I think you engage with industry differently. I mean, if you're the only supplier, you have to work out the uses, the requirements, the capabilities that you need the system to perform and be able to explain to, to someone, this is what I need it to do. Mm -hmm. But with, with something like artificial intelligence and the, the number of applications, you're finding people in a natural disaster. Can you locate them so you can rescue them faster? Has a, there's a value to the Department of Defense in that. Well, there's civilian applications for that same type of, mm -hmm. of tool. So this is one where you want to see where the private sector is able to go. There may be places you need to go to, to take it in a different direction. They wouldn't, but it's much more complementary, and you're likely to see breakthroughs in the commercial side. We go, aha, you know, we, can, we can help use that to solve some of the challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just think about it, uh, logistics, right, spare parts, all these sorts of things, there's an application for artificial intelligence for maintenance mm -hmm. that is tremendously valuable. So we often think on the, the pointy end of the spear, but... Some of our money is on significant money in the back office right. and the ability to introduce those technologies into those areas where there's an exact commercial equivalent. Somebody's mm -hmm. doing the exact same thing in their area. Yeah. That's a tremendous value. And that may be some places where you see them move first. 
And do you need, does the department need to think differently about the way in which it engages with industry or what parts of the private sector it engages with mm -hmm. in order to access some of those technologies that are being developed outside of the defense apparatus? It does. I think the secretary has been very keen on this in his outreach to a number, you know, Silicon Valley and other areas, and a lot of the leadership in the Defense Department has recognized you can't expect uh, the innovative uh, business sections of the private sector to easily come into the Defense Department rules. You have to build a bridge either through an outreach process or through a different type of contracting process to, to engage them mm -hmm. in a way that they're able to, to perform without turning themselves into an exclusively defense contractor. Yeah. And does the department, in your view, have the authorities that it needs and the tools it needs to be able to do that? I think we do to get started. I'll never say we have all the authorities and okay. tools we need because <laughs> the next budget rollout will then prove that I wasn't right. But I think we've, we've got the position we need to have a good start. Great. Um, you know, the Hill is busy working away on they their are. bills, mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of which popped last week. Mm -hmm. um, the Hack D's mark, the mm -hmm. House um, Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee for Defense, uh, had some interesting things to say, in, particularly in the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. space. Sorry to keep coming back, but I think it's fascinating. Um, you know, they increased uh, investment in the program I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you know, low-cost turtle aircraft. They reduced funding substantially for the Joint Artificial Intelligence mm -hmm. Center. And I was kind of wondering what you make of that, uh, you know, what sure. that kind of change would do to the department's ability to pursue some of those technologies. So they took, I think, $42 million out of artificial intelligence, put about 50 into the, 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 low, uh, the attributable aircraft. I think two things that I take away from this. One is that Hale is has generally supportive of the types of directions we're heading. And so what you're going to see is a different emphasis on this technology or this issue and others. So they might see one that's particularly promising and put additional resources against it. Mm -hmm. And then another place they might dial it back, not because they're headed to a different direction, but a different set of emphasis. The other one, and it's particularly true with the appropriators, you always have to double back and understand, is the mark a question about the nature of the program or is it an executability issue, mm -hmm. which is they tend to particularly focus on you're given $100, but you only be able to spend 80 based on where the program is. Mm -hmm. They take the last 20, not because they don't like it, but because they need it for the next other priority, and it's a limited budget. Mm -hmm. So we'll, you know, we'll see two more committees, Mark, and then we'll work with them. If there are impacts to the strategy, we'll make sure they understand those. But uh, I look forward to working with each of these committees, and they're all their hearts are in the right place, so I appreciate their time and energy on this. Yeah, everybody's on the same team. They, um, uh, Senate Armed Services Committee also put out their mark last week, and one of the many things that they highlighted uh, was uh, munitions investment, in mm -hmm. particular uh, industrial-based capacity. So one of the things that I was um, very encouraged to see mm -hmm. in the, the 2020 request from the department uh, was maximum rate production for mm -hmm. many of these kind of critical munitions, mm -hmm. El-Razm, Jasm, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but it raises the question, in my mind at least, you know, if we're buying these munitions at their maximum rates in peacetime, mm -hmm. what does that say about the sufficiency of the capacity of the industrial base were we to get into a shooting war? Mm -hmm. um, and, and do we need to make additional investment there to make sure that there is ability to grow if necessary? Right. So you bring up a good point. So we look at what the inventory levels are that we need mm -hmm. to be able to perform the mission under various warfighting scenarios. But you always run into the question, what's the industry capable of producing mm -hmm. if asked to ramp up? Now, we're, we're not in the case where we need them to do that, but it is one of the areas that we look at to say, is this a production line that in the event of a crisis could double, or is it one that simply can't? This is what it's capable, and you have to be careful when you're doing the, the planning that you account for that. Mm -hmm. But it is always going to be a challenge. Okay. Um, Moving on to the prospects for a budget deal mm -hmm. now, um, the president's budget request structure was interesting this year. Mm -hmm. um, technically adhered to the Budget Control Act caps mm -hmm. on both defense and non-defense discretionary spending, but increased OCO funding mm -hmm. for defense by about 150 mm -hmm. percent. Um, you know, the original position out of the White House seemed to be that they did not want a deal, but negotiations are happening. Mm -hmm between congressional leadership and the White House now. And so I'm wondering, you know, what is the administration's position on the deal at this time? So the administration, you know, submitted its budget. It laid out the vision that, that it wanted. Each of the committees and the budget committees as well has sort of laid out alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, not everyone's finished marking. And mm -hmm. so I know they had some meetings last week. They'll, they'll have some more whenever the next window is. 
they've got some time to work through this mm -hmm. uh, in order to work their way through the, you know, the different permutations. At the end of the day, from the department's perspective, we're particularly focused you know, on time mm -hmm. and, and timely and stable so that we understand and can plan accordingly. We had a significant benefit with having everything enacted on time last mm -hmm. year. Yep. And I think when we look forward to this, I'm, I'm generally optimistic. And part of the reason I'm optimistic is the longer it goes after 1 October, the darker it gets. Yeah. Right, and I think you end up with a harder and harder time getting something through once you start getting into January or February. So, we always hope for a budget on time, we too. Do. And we're frequently we do. disappointed. When I tell people about the year we got the appropriate bill done before August recess, they act like I'm talking about dinosaurs. Oh my gosh, well, that was certainly so. man, something to aspire to. Um, so, there are a couple issues here I want to unpack a little bit. Um, the first, you know, that hack D marked to mm -hmm. 733 for national mm -hmm. defense. SASC marked to 750, mm -hmm. which was where the administration's mm -hmm. request was. And so that seems to be the, the range that we're dealing with, at least mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, you know, I, I wonder what your sense is of how those initial talks that occurred last week went, how they're going. You said you're optimistic about a deal by October 1st. I wonder why. Well, so first of all, I think if you ask me why, I'd say, you know, having worked with each of the committees and worked with the folks in the administration, there is a very shared consensus on the importance of defense. Mm -hmm. uh, there is not that much difference in strategy. There's some differences in people's preferred top line. There's some differences in emphasis on individual programs. But I think everyone understands the value of getting to a solution in defense. Now, we may get held up with a series of other issues, and that's often the, the fate of the defense bill. But I think when you have good people with, with good intentions working through this, I work from the position of optimism, mm. uh, and then we plan accordingly. I think I would share your optimism um, if it were simply a decision on the defense bill in isolation, but there, I think, are a couple issues, uh, the non-defense side of the ledger, for example, that, that can have a real impact uh, on the ability to reach a deal on defense mm -hmm. um, as well as funding for the border wall. That does happen. It yeah, does complicate things. it does issue. complicate things. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, speaking of planning, mm -hmm. planning accordingly, um, you know, should the department or some portion of the federal government, including the department, still be under a continuing resolution by mid-January, sequester mm -hmm. is, is back mm -hmm. uh, for the first time since 2013. Mm -hmm. um, are, you, are you doing any planning for that, for how to manage that? So currently we're in 19, yeah. and so we have the budget to get us through the end of the year. Okay. And so the challenge you're talking about will show up in 20. Mm -hmm. Hopefully as we get closer to the fall, we'll have a much better idea of what 20 and 21 have in store. Okay. I think what I'd, just, I'd say about sequestration is, you know, the tool behind sequestration was designed to be a problem so serious that nobody went there, right? And as a threat tool, that's, that's fine. But, but actual sequestration is a gift to our enemies. You, if you actually pull the trigger and do that, you've wreaked tremendous damage to the readiness of the military. You've moved backwards dramatically. A lot of the investments you made get undone because of that damage. And so I think that's a place you don't ever want to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree wholeheartedly, except for the fact that we went there once already. Yep. And so I think I was, uh, I don't know if uh, Bob Hale was here, but I was in a meeting with him when we were discussing the prospects. And the challenge is if you end up in a box where there's no way out, you default. It's not a, something yeah. people choose. And so yeah. I think planning in advance to stay out of that is important. It's important. Um, so we talked a little bit about kind of the, the range that appears to be on the table between 733 mm -hmm. and 750. Um, you know, were a deal to come out at the, at the 733 level, um, are you satisfied with that outcome? So we like 750. We asked okay. for 750. Okay. The SASC did 750. Mm -hmm. I know the other, some of the other committees are at, at 733. We have two more still to go. So I think that um, we will look forward to working with them on trying to strike it. There's a question of sort of what's contained within those numbers as well. Mm -hmm. But our, our preferred number is 750. 750. Okay. Um, that's true. I always remind people that when Congress decides to cut your top line, it off also provides instructions for how to do that. It it's does. not left it, to the discretion it, of the department. It does. So uh, I, I imagine that, that a lot of the um, devil's in the details as always. Mm. Uh, I think I'm going to open up for questions from the audience right now. If you could please wait for the microphone um, and then identify yourself and where you are from. Uh, you ready? Cool. And we'll start right here. 
Hello, uh, Tony Bertuca, Inside Hello. Defense. Thank you for, for being here. I wanted to ask a question about the proposed restriction on reprogramming uh -huh. authority. Um, you've already said that that's obviously it's, it's suboptimal. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering if you could un unpack for us how how bad it would be. Sort of, are you back to sports uh, analogies? Are you injured or are you hurt? Sort of, is it discomfort or is it really bad for you to only do? I think maybe it would be a billion dollars worth of reprogramming as opposed to the current four. Uh, what, what's that mean to the department? So the reprogramming authority, when it's limited, creates significant challenges, not just for the department, but, but for the, the Congress as well. And so we recognize you know, the, the challenges that created the, the committee's reaction, and I don't, I don't want to disparage where they're coming from at all. But I think when you look at what the effect of that is on the department, you've sent a signal inside the department that people's ability to realign from low to high priority, from where they see an opportunity that would benefit the taxpayer or be able to provide better security, and makes it harder to move in that direction. I think those are the types of trade-offs you want to encourage. Those are the things that we want to, to be able to identify. We always have uncertainty that we need to respond to, and so you sort of lose some of the flexibility to respond to that as well. I know the committee understands this, and I don't think this was something they, they set out uh, to do automatically, but I think that's something where we need to really understand the consequences of doing it and being able to make sure that the essential missions get done and we send the right signals inside the workforce about making sure that we're able to, to put the right funding in the highest priority areas. Okay. Um, just uh, over here, lady in the glasses. Uh, thank you. Vivian Mashi with Defense mm -hmm. Daily. I wanted to ask a question about the Space Force proposal mm -hmm. as included in the SASC mark. Mm -hmm. um, so SASC made a few administrative changes to the original legislative proposal, mm -hmm. naming, namely um, removing the Undersecretary for Space mm -hmm. position and adding an Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. So I was just curious if um, you guys have spoken with SASC about those, if you are open to those sorts of administrative changes and what that might do for the Space Force proposal going forward. Okay, thank you, Thanks. Vivian, for raising it. I think, first of all, we're just pleased, we're, we're pleased that the SASC included it. We, you know, one of the things for us is the essential role of having the Space Force for being able to uh, operate in the domain and be able to do the type of planning that you really need that organizational structure to do. They made some changes. The answer is that's, that's the sort of thing we expect each committee to do. Uh, they haven't, I don't believe they've released all the bill language, so we're going to have to spend some time when that comes out to walk through exactly what all of it means. But I'm very supportive, and I think the SASC has been very supportive of this initiative. I doubt there's anything that they've been talking about that we wouldn't be able to work through and find a way to address. So I think this is something where I look forward to engaging with them and building on uh, what they've recommended and what issues they've seen and make sure we can address them. But it's a great step forward. On the aisle, right here. Hi, sir. Russ Reed with the Washington Examiner. Mm -hmm. Going back to the uh, Senate NDAA markup, uh, one thing that caught my eye was the p highlight on coal ash and rare earths. Okay. Could you speak a little bit to the importance of these going forward as we start to look more at a great power competition? So there are certain elements that are used in the production of different pieces of military equipment. And I won't match the element to the item, but, but there are certain ones, and you need to make sure you have either a stockpile or access to those. And so that's just an area where, as you look across those systems and you look at your future production, the question is, do I have those? Do I have enough of them? Do I have access to them? Where are they produced? And I think that's a proper place for the, the Congress to have focused on, and that's an area worth highlighting. And I think we look forward to working with them on how best to make sure we protect those areas. Sure. In the aisle, right here. Hi, sir. Don Klein, uh, Elbit Systems America. I'm going to go back up to the 30,000-foot level for a second and talk a little bit about st strategy and operational concepts. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the uh, department is putting as much rigor into developing new operational concepts to take full advantage of the technology as they are in the acquisition of the technology? So I appreciate the question because this is an area when we, we talked at the beginning about what's been done and what's, what's left to be done. This is an area where there's a lot of work going on in the department and will continue to do so for at least the next year or two. And in fact, there's additional funds that we've put in the budget. The National Defense uh, uh, NDS assessment team, one of the things they commented about was analytic capability. We agreed with them 
we put additional money off of net assessment cape other places to be able to enhance that analytic capability to support those concepts of operations but what you're really looking for is sort of a, a triplet of things you've got new technology that you have prototypes for you've got exercises where you can experiment with them and then you have the concept of operation of how to make it all come together that's the thing you really want to push on and explore because they feed each other you start expanding on a particular concept and you realize how essential a particular technology is to that solution i think the example that you know for people who the historical example is often egypt as you enter between world war one and world war two people had radios they had the combustion engine they started playing around with these things called tanks and what they eventually realized was a tank by itself isn't that interesting but when you mechanize the infantry when you put the artillery on tracks when you have an entire division that's able to go 15 miles an hour instead of foot speed now instead of just having an armored gun walking next to an infantry you have an entirely different way of warfare and so i think those are the sort of things that when you do concepts of operations the interaction of the technology with a different way of fighting can produce dramatic results and that's where experimentation is so key uh Aaron here in the front, and then we'll work our way around. Thanks, Aaron Meadow with Defense News. Mm -hmm. um, we talked. You talked a little bit about the Iran situation mm -hmm. and some of the stuff that's been written about how that mm -hmm. could impact the NDS. This is a sign the NDS is not working. In your mind, how does the NDS fail? What happens to make that not work out in the long term? So I think the key for the NDS is being able to maintain our focus on the long-term high-end fight while still performing the other functions and so do you maintain the, the the focus on the new technologies do you maintain the investments in those new areas i think if you were to see a, a wholesale move away either against experimentation or against the new technologies and simply doubling down on the production of, of older generations that would be a problem that would be shifting us away from being able to meet the emerging threats there's a lot of existing technology that will still be relevant and useful in the future, but you need to be doing that experimentation. You need to be doing uh, that research and development to pull it all together. So I think as long as we maintain the focus, and this is where you get the secretary's line, China, 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 is a reminder to the organization, we will not take our eye off the ball. If that's the, the, the long-term issue, that's the key driver, stay focused on that, even as we're doing all the other meetings that we've got in a day. So based on my background, I'd always say it's the budget. That's sort of my <laughs> cultural habit. But the truth is the, the NDS is a much about a direction and an approach and how you do things. So I think it's broader than just the budget. But certainly, you can have setbacks in the budget that will delay your ability to implement the vision. And will, you can lose years in budget marks in being able to achieve what you're headed towards. But you'd still be headed in the same direction. Paul, up here in the front row. Oh, sorry, Mark, I'll, I see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm Paul Sony from the Washington Post. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us an update on um, the use of military construction funds for the wall, where that stands. I think the last time um, I was dialed in on that, uh, the Joint Staff was supposed to do some sort of um, assessment, and that was supposed to go to the Secretary of Defense's um, office. Uh, I was wondering if the legal challenges to that have held up uh, spending that, that military construction money on the wall and if you still expect that that $3.6 billion will get spent by the end of the fiscal year. So I believe that the recent court rulings, while they mentioned the, what you call the 2808 authority, did not actually do anything to prevent the movement forward. So the documents you talked about are, are on their way to the secretary. He's actually in Asia right now. When we get back to the direction of the NDS, you can see he's, he's there. And the, you know, the, the by, with, and through the allies is an important part of our strategy. But I think when he comes back, as we go to the, uh, the weeks ahead, there will be decisions that need to be made on those items, and that's where, that's where they stand right now. Mark, right in the back of the aisle. <laughs> Thank you. Mark Cancio from CSIS. I'm happy to have deferred to the uh, journalists. Um, but my question is about the top line. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chairman Dunford. Uh, spoke at Brookings just the other day, said 3 to 5% real growth was still his target. The mm -hmm. DOD top line, of course, did not provide that. It's uh, stable in constant dollar terms. So I was wondering what your plan is to, to cover that gap and whether you believe that gap, in fact, exists. Right. So I think what I'd, I'd say is when you started, when you looked when they started talking about 3 to 5% a couple of years ago, 
That was the trajectory they wanted to be on. The first year, the number went up between 8 and 10 percent. And then the second year is flat. And then this year, our budget is, I think, 2.8 percent or so of real growth. So if, if you don't mind the stair-stepping function, you're basically heading on that trajectory. And that was partly a reflection of what it needed to do to get out of sequestration as well as the challenges coming up. So I think we're doing well against that. Frankly, I, I'm pleased with the way the administration and Congress reached an agreement because moving some of those increases up sooner is much better for the department long term than the, the slow growth over time. Go to Gab Gabby, did you have a question? <laughs> Gabby Burrell from the Australian Embassy. I mm -hmm. uh, just wanted to ask you about with the three pillars in the NDS and obviously mm -hmm. working with allies is a, an important one for us, but we also see opportunities in terms of uh, lethality and organisational reform as the other two pillars where there's also uh, work that can be good work that can be done, um, you know, areas like inclusion in the national technological industrial base, mm -hmm. um, closer cooperation, you know, removing red tape, that sort of thing. Uh, are you satisfied that across the board um, there's a, an appreciation of, of that role that, uh, that allies can bring to this in the challenge that you're dealing with? Oh, absolutely. I think that, you know, when we talk about the national defence strategy and the three lines of effort, number two is by, with, and through allies. And let me just give a, a shout out to Australia because the relationships that we have with Australia are exceptional. The, the support, the cooperation, the, the, the ability to work together uh, is fantastic. And I think the type of thing that each country brings to the table, both in technology and in abilities, is complementary. And I would just highlight if you, you know, when people, if you don't fully appreciate the value of our alliance structure, look at those of some of our potential rivals and think how many friends they have and count them on how many fingers you have. It's a completely different world. It's just because of the difference with the way we engage with other countries on a cooperative basis. And so I think everyone inside the department understands the essential value of that and looks forward on finding ways to expand on building on those connections. Admiral Haney? Question uh, associated a bit with uh, this age of competition and the national defense mm -hmm. strategy. Uh, some of the leaders have talked about the need to move faster in oh. terms of uh, procuring things. As you look at the current mechanism, the palm process, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, has this budget or do you envision other changes that we need to make in order to be able to do just that, make good decisions, but also move faster so we can get capability into the warfighters' hands to experiment with or go in combat with? So there's been a number of efforts on this issue because it's sort of been a perennial challenge. And I think some of the things you look at first is ways of accelerating contracting. And there's been a number of changes Congress has put in place. The department is implementing like Section 804 and so forth to accelerate that. Number of initiatives with regard to um, prototyping organizations that move prototypes out into the hands of the field to get initial capabilities. I think every one of these is a step in the right direction. I think we have to keep looking for how do we institutionalize these, make these a permanent feature. So some of these are the experiments. It does this work well? But as we move past this, building those in so we can take an idea, get a demonstration of it, put it in the hands of somebody who has to use it in real life environment, get immediate feedback on it, and still work all that within the budget cycle with the Hill, which, as you point out, is, is a, you know, it, it takes us a while from the department to assemble the budget before it even gets to the Hill, and then there's a full cycle on the Hill as well, and so that can become a challenge. I'm so pleased you asked that question because it's the very topic of my next research project <laughs> report forthcoming in the fall. Excellent. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay. Oh, sure. Mark again. <laughs> Just one last uh, crack at that deputy here. Um, one thing you didn't talk about was management reform, mm -hmm. and that was, of course, one of the three pillars in the NDS. And from an outsider's point of view, it seemed like the White House originally believed that there was a lot of waste in the Department of Defense and that the administration would be able to identify that, and that would create the headroom needed uh, to uh, fund the new strategy. But mm -hmm. they have found out, I think, like most people, that there are choices available. They're very difficult choices. They require political capital. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there's been very little in terms of actual savings that has been uh, rolled out. I know the department has put some numbers out mm -hmm. without a whole lot of backup. And I was wondering if what was going on there, whether we could 
uh, uh, whether we're going to see something uh, come out in the future. Sure. So I think one of the things for those, you know, the national defense strategy we talked about first was readiness and lethality by, with, and through allies is level of line of effort number two. And this is line of effort number three. So I'm glad you let us make sure we hit all three parts of the national defense strategy before wrapping up. So inside that area, there's a number of reforms that are going on, and a number of them are that, are, that are generating savings uh, as we go forward, and we've already started to see the benefits of those. As we look forward, we're looking at ways with contracting, and we've done this in a couple of areas already, and the CMO, Chief Management Officer, is the lead, looking across places where we contract for the same thing in multiple places, looking at where we have one contract that's, that's less expensive and shifting our buy. This shows up a lot with IT licenses, where in a lot of IT licenses, the first 10 licenses have one price. You go up in quantity, the cost per unit goes down. So as you get more visibility across the department of your IT network, you can start to realize you have five separate contracts for that type of license. And if you consolidated them, your price for every license goes down. So there are folks diligently working each one of these areas. And I appreciate the cost because I don't think I'm allowed to actually finish a, a moment without uh, a meeting without ending with the word audit somewhere in it. And so we did complete the, the first financial statement audit. We've started the second. We've already started to see the benefit of that. Navy Air Station Jacksonville, where I was just recently down with the vice president, they recovered $80 million worth of inventory to be able to put back into the system that they've discovered and identified during the audit process. So we are seeing tangible benefits from these reform efforts today. We just want to make sure they're sustainable and large enough because we recognize in the long run when we balance security and solvency, there's a limit to how much defense can grow with compared to the economy, and we're going to need to constantly generate those savings. In addition to which, we just have a responsibility to be good stewards of taxpayers' money. And every effort we put into these to make sure we spend money wisely is time well spent. Okay. Aaron, I think you had a, another question. So right now, of course, we have an acting Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. You're performing the duties of. Mm -hmm. uh, CMO is performing the duties of. Mm -hmm. There's various other spots. Are we seeing, are you seeing an oh. impact inside the building? I'm not asking about the, the powers going to Congress and mm -hmm. dealing with Congress, but inside the building on just getting things done, whether it's uh, mission-oriented or whether it's things like reform efforts, just getting paper pushed, getting people to agree on things. So I haven't seen it. I know we've got you know, a nominee going forward for both the, the Secretary and the Secretary of the Air Force, so those are going to be filled. The, you know, the, um, the core team is in place. We've worked with the, you know, the people we're talking about, Jerry, talking about the CMO, the acting CMO, uh, is familiar with the, the building and the organization, has been in the deputy CMO position. I've been in the department. I think, actually, as of next week, will be two years in my third time in the department, so I don't know what I'm doing that I keep getting pulled back in. But all of those are continuing to drive forward. The team works together very well. And so I think that I have no doubt that we'll continue to be able to move forward on the mission as we go through this. 